time to re-up YouTube, your boy Young Mustard is back with another video. Ever since LeBron James left Cleveland the first time, he has taken his career in his own hands and for the better. He's a multiple time NBA champion, he's won MVP since then, and he's gone on to establish a career that many consider is the greatest in basketball history. But what about the tenure in Cleveland that he spent before he left in 2010? It seems like now in present day, so many people make up narratives about LeBron's time in Cleveland before he left for Miami and I have to say so many people look ridiculous it's either you're on one side of the spectrum that's extreme or the other either you think he was just carrying around a bunch of bums throughout all of his time in Cleveland or you thought LeBron was underperforming every year while his teammates were better than people said which led me to make this video and talk about LeBron's first tenure in Cleveland the falsehoods the truths and everything in between with the first pick in the 2003 NBA draft, the Cleveland Cavaliers select LeBron James. There he is with his mom, Gloria. As we all know, LeBron was taken with the first overall pick in the 2003 iconic NBA draft. A draft that was so top heavy, it featured multiple Hall of Fame players taken within the first couple of picks. Obviously, LeBron included with Dwayne Wade, Carmelo Anthony, and Chris Bosh. Now, one thing about LeBron James, like many other first overall picks, he did not go to a great situation. He went to one of the worst teams in the league at the time, the Cleveland Cavaliers, which so happened to be his hometown. So the pressure on LeBron James was not only from the media telling him that he's going to be the next Michael Jordan and him embracing that in high school, but it came from his hometown Cleveland itself. And out the gates, as we all know, LeBron James immediately impressed not only Cleveland, but the NBA basketball world as a whole. LeBron, as an 18 year old, fresh out of high school in the dead ball era, averaged 21 points, six assists, nearly six rebounds and two steals on 42% shooting from the field and 75% at the free throw line. LeBron immediately came in the NBA with the passing gift, high basketball IQ for somebody of his age and status in the league. And though his scoring game wasn't as polished as it later on became to be, he was not only young into his career in his rookie season, but he was still growing into his body. As I said earlier, he was only 18 years old. If you just take a picture of LeBron James in 2003 and look at a picture of LeBron James in 2005 or 2007, you can see clear growth in his body body size and frame. He was already a freak of nature coming into the league, but he expounded on that in the years to come. And as we talk about expounding, that leads into what LeBron did in year two, which is increase his statistical output all across the board. As after winning rookie of the year, LeBron increased his averages to 27 points a game, seven assists and seven rebounds, over two steals a game with the true shooting percentage of 55%. That was his first ever year as an all-star and he actually made second team All-NBA as well. In these years LeBron still struggled with his jump shot but even in his sophomore year he showed the ability to improve as a jump shooter going from 29% on less than three attempts a game in his rookie year to nearly four attempts a game on 35% from three. He was still a very streaky shooter as not only his mid-range shooting indicated that but his free throw shooting still shooting in the mid 70s but the force of nature that is LeBron James to be able to get to the rim has been something that's carried over not only from his rookie year to his sophomore year but even up until now where he's nearly 40 years old. Back then, LeBron was able to just will himself to the rim at ease, which created so many opportunities and advantages for his teammates to eat off of his gravity, and that's exactly what he did. And one of those teammates that ate in this time period was Carlos Boozer. Carlos Boozer is actually one of the better power forwards of the 2000s, and many people forget how good he was when he went to Utah. But he's so forgotten for what he did in Utah that it also bleeds into his time in Cleveland that people don't even talk about at all. As him the year prior in the 2002 NBA draft was taken by the Cleveland Cavaliers in the second round and probably ended up being the biggest steal in that draft class. As after a rookie season where he just averaged 10 points a game alongside LeBron James in year two and LeBron's year one, Booster took a leap all across the board to averaging nearly 16 points a game, 11 rebounds and two assists, the steal shooting 52% from the field and 77% at the free throw line. Boozer 
was a very solid big in the post. He was a good pick and roll partner as well. And obviously, as the numbers indicate, he was very active on the glass. And unlike many other players that LeBron James played with in Cleveland, especially in that first in, I should say, Boozer was fairly young. He was only 22 years old in the lone season that they played together in 2003. Sure, he wasn't 18 or 19 like LeBron James was at the time, but still, he was not some guy in his mid 20s or late 20s or early 30s. His better years were ahead of him, and he showed a lot of growth in just the one season that he played alongside LeBron James. Now, why was it one season, you ask? Well, that's a good question because this is the beginning of what I like to call the poor front office management by the Cleveland Cavaliers throughout LeBron James' first tenure. Now, this really is up for your interpretation on who you want to believe in this situation, but I tend to lean towards Carlos Boozer's recollection of events because the Cavs are just not to be trusted whatsoever. As due to Carlos Boozer being a second round pick, he was only afforded two years with the Cleveland Cavaliers before he could become a restricted free agent. After the 2004 NBA season, the Cavs had the option of allowing him to become a restricted free agent or keeping him under contract for one more year at $695,000. The Cavs claimed to reach an understanding with Carlos Boozer and his agent on a deal for approximately $39 million over six years, assuming he would re-sign had they let him out of his current deal. Cleveland then proceeded to release him from his contract, which made him a restricted free agent. And during this period though, the Utah Jazz offered Carlos Boozer a six year, $70 million contract, which the Cavs chose not to match. The then owner of the Cleveland Cavaliers, Gordon Gunn said, in the final analysis, I decided to trust Carlos and show him the respect he asked for. He did not show that trust and respect in return. But Carlos Boozer responded and denied those claims by the Cavaliers saying there was no commitment. It's unfortunate how the turn of events went through in the media, but I'm not a guy that gives my word and takes it away. I think I've made that clear. So off rip, there was incompetence in the front office. One way or another, Carlos Boozer should have been LeBron James teammate for a good chunk of his Cleveland tenure the first time. As Boozer throughout his tenure with the Utah Jazz went on to be a multiple time all-star and even made a 13 All-NBA in 2008. Boozer may not go into the Hall of Fame, but he is still one of the better players at his position, and that is much better than a lot of the pieces that LeBron James had to work with in Cleveland. As a matter of fact, scratch that, it's better than all the pieces that he had to work with in Cleveland. I mean, don't get me wrong, there were some really solid to decent players that LeBron James had in his first stint in Cleveland, but I think a lot of people like to play both sides when it comes to that conversation. As you can fast forward to 2000. 2006 and 2007 and look at the roster that LeBron James was playing with and the box score is definitely going to tell you one thing and I can tell you another. As an 06, we saw LeBron James average 31 points a game along with 7 assists and 7 rebounds on 48% shooting from the field, which was at that time in LeBron James' career the best season that he has ever had in his professional life. He led them to 50 wins and they made the second round of the playoffs, losing to the Detroit Pistons who had just came off of a finals appearance the year prior in seven games. In that series, LeBron only had one teammate average double digits in points per game, and that was Big Z himself, Zadrunas Ilgauskas. Everybody else was pretty much just there. And this wasn't always the case every year, but it became a pattern for a good chunk of his time. But that finally leads us to the 2007 NBA season, a year in which LeBron James made his first ever NBA finals. Now, over time, a lot of people have looked at this year pretty controversial, and in my personal opinion, I don't look at it one extreme or the other. Yes, it is impressive for a 22-year-old LeBron James to lead an NBA team to the finals. No matter what the supporting cast is or the competition is, to get through three rounds of an NBA playoffs as the best player at 22 years of age is not something that a lot of players in NBA history can say or be able to do. Now, I'm not going to overblow this accomplishment and say that's why he's the greatest ever or LeBron James is better at backpacking teams than Kobe Bryant or KD or Michael Jordan because of this. Because at the end of the day, the Eastern Conference was pretty weak at the time. He went through three 500 teams in order to get to the Eastern Conference Finals. And beating the Detroit Pistons with the supporting cast that he had at his disposal definitely is impressive. I'm not going to deny that at all. But this still isn't the same Pistons team that made the NBA Finals in 2005 or the Pistons team that he faced the year prior when they didn't make the finals in 2006. This is a Pistons team that already lost their best defender in Ben Wallace, and some would even make the argument in some years he was their best 
player. Nonetheless though, that Pistons team was still far more equipped to beat the Cleveland Cavaliers than vice versa. And LeBron James in game five had one of the most iconic performances in the history of basketball, scoring 25 straight points to close out the game, which includes a fourth quarter with 11 points and back-to-back -back overtimes of nine points each. LeBron in that series, and especially in that game, was the definition of putting your team on your back and doing whatever it takes to win. As you can see right now with this box score that LeBron James did everything humanly possible to get them the win, and he did it in under seven games. It's very impressive what LeBron did against that Pistons team in the conference finals. And don't get me wrong, some of his teammates actually did step up. Booby Gibson, he shot 50% from three, and he did that on 24 attempts in a six game series. That's very impressive. But let's be serious here, looking at the rest of the supporting cast on paper, watching the tape, using the box score, whatever metric you wanna use, LeBron James was carrying those guys. They were very dependent on LeBron James production in order for them to succeed as players. Whether they're a spot up guy like Booby Gibson, or you're a guy in the post that needs LeBron to get you the ball in certain spots to be effective like Ilgauskas. And then when you look at the rest of the supporting cast, guys like Verajao, Pavlovich, Larry Hughes, some of those are really solid defensive players, especially Verajao and Larry Hughes. But offensively, they have their clear holes that LeBron James made up for and then some. They made the NBA Finals in 07, but unfortunately, like we all know, they were swept by the San Antonio Spurs. And some may make the argument that those games were winnable and it was a close series because they lost each and every game by less than double digits. But please do not let the end result in the box score fool you. That series was not particularly close. It was really filled with a lot of fake comebacks with the Spurs being up big, the Cavs making a little bit of a run, and then the Spurs finish off the job in the fourth quarter. Now I will admit though, the criticisms about LeBron James at this point in his career were very valid. LeBron in that series was exploited for his lack of a jump shot as they sagged off him completely, play drop coverage, and Tim Duncan was right there in the paint at the rim to meet LeBron James on all of his contests basically. So LeBron had some valid criticisms for him as a player, but as far as him getting to the NBA Finals, the postseason as a whole, it was a success for an organization that had never seen an NBA Finals in its history. And you would think the organization in front office would realize, damn, we gotta put some pieces around LeBron James because he's great and he got us here, but we need pieces in order to carry us over the top. So what do they do the next year when they're having somewhat of a down season as far as their win total goes, only winning less than 50 games, which was a step back from the year prior, they go out and trade Larry Hughes in order to get Ben Wallace. Yes, Ben Wallace, not Detroit Ben Wallace, but Chicago Ben Wallace. Now one may be saying, oh, but doesn't that fit the defensive identity of the Cleveland Cavaliers? I mean, it can't be that bad, right? Well, for starters, Ben Wallace defensively was not the same player that he was in Detroit. He was far removed from that actually. But the real problem comes on the offensive side of the ball, because as bad as Larry Hughes can be in moments because he's a very limited offensive player come postseason time, he still does have some semblance of value as a floor spacer, especially back then when floor spacing was actually undervalued compared to obviously like it is today. And getting Ben Wallace to replace that, or should I say offset that with his defense is ridiculous considering how bad of an offensive player he was, not only at the time, but really ever. Ben Wallace was never a real good offensive player. And at that point, he was even worse. You were getting a washed up player that was nowhere near the level of play that made him a Hall of Fame caliber player that he is today. They also traded for Delonte West and that wasn't going to patch up what Larry Hughes did for them on the defensive side of the ball on the perimeter. So they took a step back from the 2007 playoff run and instead of making the NBA finals or conference finals for that matter, they would go out in the second round after a season in which LeBron James averaged 30 points a game for the second time in his career and led the league in scoring. It was because becoming pretty obvious and clear that LeBron James just did not have the facilities to work for an NBA championship. But then in 2009, everything changed for the better, at least at that time, for LeBron James and the Cleveland Cavaliers. As in the summer of 2008, the Cavaliers were involved in a three-team, six-player deal involving the Bucks and the Oklahoma City Thunder, which resulted in them receiving Mo Williams from the Milwaukee Bucks. Williams was coming off of a pretty solid career season with averages of 17, 6, and four, shooting 48% from the field, 39% from three, and 86% at the free throw line. He was also 26 years of age and had just signed a six-year $52 million extension.
option the year prior in 2007, so you didn't have to worry about re-signing him anytime soon. Williams immediately made an offensive impact on that team, giving LeBron James another option as a playmaker and somewhat decent shot creator at the time, which led Mo Williams to not only have a career season in his points per game, but to be his first time ever all-star teammate. And I know LeBron has also played with other guys that made all-star teams, but I'm talking about while LeBron was teammates with him, he was an all-star in 2009. Along with playmaking, Williams was able to replace and even in surplus add floor spacing that Larry Hughes had left on the table. LeBron James led the Cleveland Cavaliers to 66 wins that regular season, which is still a franchise record to this day. James had probably the best regular season of his career, averaging 28 points, seven assists, and eight rebounds, along with two steals and over a block, shooting 49% from the field, 34% from three, and 78% at the free throw line, which accumulates to a true shooting percentage of 59%. When you add in the fact that not only was he dominant as a scorer and playmaker, but also as a defensive player, it's no surprise that he was not only first team All-NBA and All-Star, but he was also voted as the MVP winner of the 2009 NBA season. LeBron was hands down, in my opinion, the best player in the NBA, not only in the regular season, but it also carried over into the playoffs. Because after the Cavaliers had their best regular season in franchise history, many people picked them to get to the NBA Finals, especially after Boston suffered an injury to their best player, Kevin Garnett, following their 2008 championship. Because not only did the Celtics lose KG, but the Celtics are the team that beat the Cavaliers the year prior in the playoffs in seven games. And now they've added Mo Williams and they've had the most successful season in franchise history. So expectations were high for an obvious reason. And come playoff time, LeBron James was ready. He played his role to perfection as the best player on the team. And not only best player on the team, but the best player in the world. Averaging 35 points a game, nine rebounds and seven assists with nearly two blocks, shooting 51% from the field. They knocked off the Pistons in the first round and the Hawks in the second round in sweeps, which is to be expected. But then the real test came in the conference finals against the Orlando Magic led by Dwight Howard, an MVP candidate, the best center in the league and the defensive player of the year. Unfortunately for the Cavaliers and LeBron James, this is where their story ended that season, losing to the Orlando Magic in six games in the Eastern Conference Finals. A conference finals that featured LeBron James averaging nearly 39 points a game along with eight rebounds and eight assists over a steal and a block, shooting 49% from the field with a true shooting percentage of 59% against an Orlando Magic team that was anchored by the defensive player of the year at the rim in Dwight Howard that was the best defense in the NBA, being first in defensive rating. And the craziest thing about this series is that LeBron James had to really squeeze out wins like he did in game two when they were down 1-0 on their home court and LeBron hit the shot around the world to win at the buzzer. He was the best player on the court throughout the entire series, but the problem was the supporting cast. As you can see right now on your screen, Dwight Howard had players like Rashard Lewis stepping up, shooting 48% from behind the arc as a power forward. That was very valuable back then. Hidu Turgulu, despite him not being efficient from the field, he shot 39% from three and also averaged 17 points, six rebounds, and seven assists. Their spot up shooter, Michael Petrus, averaged 13 points a game, but shot 47% from three throughout the duration of that series. Meanwhile, when you look at LeBron James supporting cast, they were just not enough to offset Dwight Howard and the others. Mo Williams was inefficient and that was his second option. That was supposed to be his Robin. Meanwhile, Mo Williams goes into the series and averages one more point than his regular season average, but 10% worse in his field goal percentage. And the rest of the supporting cast is so LeBron James dependent that their numbers are so misleading and they're not even that good anyway. Delonte West cannot go out there and shoot 32% from three and expect to keep up with Hudu Turgaloo and Michael Petra shooting 47 and 39% each. Then he throw in Ilgauskas who had the task of guarding Dwight Howard and was just obliterated on both sides of the ball by him. This was the series that I believe showed LeBron James and plenty of other people in the NBA community that he just did not have the supporting cast to go up against the best of the best teams. The man averaged nearly 40 in the conference finals and it didn't even go seven. The saddest thing about this series is that the Orlando Magic went to the NBA finals and though some of those games were close, they lost in five to the Los Angeles Lakers. It wasn't even as if this 
Magic team, though it was ahead of its time, they were not some juggernaut that the Cavs could not beat whatsoever. It was just not a good matchup. The other guys stepped up and LeBron James guys didn't plain and simple. And this was a very important year for the Cleveland Cavaliers as an organization because LeBron James next year was the last year on his contract. And despite their great regular season success, they've seen great regular season success in the past winning 50 plus games and even making the NBA finals before in 2007. Winning 66 games is cool, but if you can't even make finals trips, what's the point? LeBron is a generational talent that had Michael Jordan expectations and they're even further away from winning a championship than where they were in 2007 when they had less talent on the roster around LeBron James. So it was safe to say that the 2010 season was going to be very intriguing for the Cleveland Cavaliers and their future keeping LeBron going forward. But as far as LeBron James goes, in 2010 he gave them his all like he always does. In the regular season he averaged nearly 30 points a game, 9 assists and 7 rebounds, over a steal and a half, shot 50% from the field, 33% from 3 and 77% at the free throw line. He had another stellar performance on the defensive side of the ball, earning another all defensive team selection. And because of his efforts offensively and defensively combined, he would win his second straight MVP award. That regular season though was filled with so many ups and downs in that front office. Let's start off with what they did in the off season before the year even started. They went out and got LeBron James another all-star. Can you believe it? Guess who that all-star was? Shaquille O'Neal. And no, obviously it isn't Lakers Shaq, it isn't Miami Shaq, it isn't Phoenix Shaq. This is Shaquille O'Neal that is one year removed from retirement. He was just a little bit better than he was in the Boston year, and that's not saying a lot. He was slow footed defensively, had little impact on that side of the ball, he was actually a drawback if anything, and offensively even though he had a couple of post moves he could use and he could be a lob threat in certain situations, he was not good enough to justify getting 20 to 25 plus minutes on a championship level team or at least a team that has aspirations to win one and it's crazy because in february of the 2010 season Shaq suffered a right thumb injury while going up for a layup on glenn davis of the celtics and he had to have surgery on march 1st and return for the playoffs so this guy is out here missing months of time and coming back right before the postseason at his old age i wonder how that's gonna turn out spoiler it didn't turn out well he was horrible in the playoffs barely gave you double digit points and was consistently in foul trouble in 22 minutes a night. And it only gets worse with what the front office did in that 2010 season. As apparently before the trade deadline in 2010, the Cavaliers had the opportunity to trade for all-star all-NBA player Amari Stoudemire. Now one would think this would be a no-brainer. LeBron James is on his contract year. You guys have not gone to the NBA finals since 2007. And then a year where Kevin Garnett is back with the team in Boston, the Shaquille O'Neal acquisition has not worked out so go and get yourself an all NBA level player to pair alongside LeBron James and Mo Williams. Create yourself a little bit of a big three if you will. Unfortunately though their new owner Dan Gilbert had other plans because he had his eyes on JJ Hickson the player that the Suns wanted in return. Dan Gilbert had so many plans for JJ Hickson's upside that he just couldn't let him go in exchange for an all NBA player. It's ridiculous honestly it's that stupid the more I say it out loud. They then instead traded for Antoine Jameson, who in their defense made sense offensively. He could space the floor and provide some of that mismatch problems that Rashard Lewis gave them in the previous year in the conference finals. I mean, in a conference where you also have to not only go against the Orlando Magic, probably if you want to get back to the finals, but you probably have to go against the Boston Celtics this time around. Let's see how it goes in the playoffs. Maybe he can pull KG out the paint with that floor spacing at the four. We fast forward to their conference semifinals matchup against the Boston Celtics. Celtics, and what does Antoine Jameson do? Well, in three out of the six games, he doesn't even get double digits in points. Well, what about his three-point percentage, right? Because that has to be what they brought him in for, right? To space the floor, pull KG out the paint. Well, unfortunately, that did not work because he shot 18% from behind the arc on less than three attempts a game. And this doesn't even include the defensive aspect because the Cavs' defensive identity was already taking a bit of a hit with Shaquille O'Neal at the rim, but when you threw in Antoine Jameson, 
Jameson, it did not help. So with all of these issues on the team, of course, in 2010, they did not make the NBA Finals. They didn't even make the Conference Finals. They were losing the semifinals against the Boston Celtics. And to be fair, LeBron James did not play his best series. His points per game, rebounds, assists, it's all gonna look nice. With averages of 27, nine and seven, along with two steals, a block and a half, shot 45% from the field, true shooting percentage of 55%. I mean, it all looks nice, but we all know in the last three games, LeBron James was not himself as compared to the first three games of that series. But at this point, it's so tough to be mad at LeBron James for underperforming because yes, he should take accountability for his play, but look at what is around him and what he has to face. He's facing the big three Boston Celtics with the best defender in the world, Kevin Garnett at the rim. A Paul Pierce, who's one of the best wings in the league, Rajon Rondo, one of the better young guards in the NBA, and Ray Allen, a sniper three-point shooter. Paired that along with a pest defensively like Tony Allen and Kendrick Perkins at the rim as well. And it's no surprise that LeBron James and the supporting cast of Shaquille O'Neal at 37 years old, his supposed all-star teammate in Mo Williams, who dropped yet again in the playoffs, averaging 13 points a game on below 41% from the field and 21% from three against the Celtics. We went over how shitty Antoine Jameson was in that series, and the rest of the supporting cast consists of who? Anthony Parker, Anderson Verajao, Delonte West, JJ Hickson. It truly was pathetic to see LeBron James struggle not only that season, but the year prior, and the year prior, and the year prior come postseason time, in part because of his own holes in his game, but also because the supporting cast just didn't do enough to help him. And that falls on the front office of the Cleveland Cavaliers for not making the necessary moves at the right times. It goes all the way back to the beginning with players like Carlos Boozer being being let go and Gordon Gunn basically making excuses for his incompetence. Then you transition to Dan Gilbert getting washed players like Ben Wallace and Shaquille O'Neal to be cornerstones of their franchise. And when it's time to actually get a true cornerstone to pair alongside LeBron James, who was in his prime performing at an all NBA level in Amari Stoudemire, you then decide to pass on him because you wanted to keep JJ Hickson. Also, you could trade JJ Hickson a year later. The only good thing I can say that the front office did was trade for Mo Williams. And what's crazy is that when Mo Williams arrived there, you immediately saw an impact not only in the regular season, but even in the playoffs and not only the team success, but LeBron James level of play also. The fact of the matter is LeBron James was putting 100% effort and the front office was not. And if you say that they were, then that just means that they suck at their job, which is why I wanted to make this video. LeBron James first stint in Cleveland comes off with so many many different narratives positively or negatively about him. The fact of the matter is he was a generational prospect and generational player and was put in a situation for a city that he grew up in, but unfortunately did not have the capability to build great rosters with solid supporting cast around LeBron James, unlike other all-time greats had coming into the league. Players like Larry Bird, Magic Johnson, Kobe Bryant, hell, even Tim Duncan, who did his fair share of carrying to championships he walked in the NBA with David Robinson in his front court. LeBron did not have the luxury of spending six to seven years alongside another all-time great or an all-star caliber player. He spent it with a lot of role players and players that were so dependent on his level of play in order to maximize theirs. And it's not to say that all those players were bad players, but LeBron James was shouldering so much that without him, they instantly dropped to one of the worst teams in the league and for good reason. The truth about LeBron James first stint in Cleveland is that it was a waste of his time, plain and simple. But hey, those are just my thoughts, you guys. I wanna know what you guys think in the comment section about LeBron James first run with the Cleveland Cavaliers. Make sure you guys drop a like as well, subscribe to the channel and press that bell for post notifications. You guys stay safe and have a blessed day. I'm out, peace. Wherever.